All right, questions eight through the end of this page um, focus mainly on the periodic table and just knowing some patterns that we see on there. Again, let's remember, you know, the periodic table has um, all the elements that we know of, many of which were created in a laboratory. Uh, most of the ones we talk about are, tend to be in the left-hand side or the right-hand side. There's a whole lot in the middle we have tended to stay away from, and there's some down here in the bottom that we never even really talk about very much. Um, there's reasons for that, but we tend to focus on the things that involve the patterns on the periodic table. So in general, we need to know uh, where these things are, 8 through 14, over um, that are listed over here on the left-hand side. Where are they on the periodic table? Now, again, there's a couple of elements on here that don't always quite fit patterns. Um, one of them is hydrogen, which is in the first column. Um, another one is helium, which is in our last group over here as well. Um, again, hydrogen doesn't quite always fit because one of the things about hydrogen is it's a gas, and pretty much you know, nothing else over here is a gas. Um, it tends to be listed in this first column because it shares one particular characteristic with everything in this first group, which is it has one valence electron. Okay, so um, when we think of where some of these things are, we always need to kind of keep an asterisk by, do we include hydrogen that way and do we include helium? Um, helium is kind of in the right place, but we tend to say everything in this last column has a full shell, their outer shell of electrons. In other words, they have eight valence electrons, but helium doesn't have eight valence electrons because it doesn't have eight electrons. Um, it's only got two electrons but its outer shell is full like everything else is in that column. So even though hydrogen and helium share things in common with other things in the columns that they're in, they're not exactly the same. So we'll keep that in mind when we go through and look at these. Um, again, metals, these are typically what makes up most of our periodic table. If we go through and kind of put a little line, we can divide the periodic table between where we have metals and where we have non-metals. Usually our periodic table has a darkened line that kind of fits in right here, which divides our metals from non-metals. So typically we have metals over here, right? Um, typically, that's what number eight is. We have non-metals over here. And again, let's remember hydrogen is also a non-metal. It's a gas um, at, at normal temperatures anyway. And then we have these things like metalloids. And again, metals tend to have certain properties. They are typically shiny. They conduct electricity, often can be made into wires. They can often be hammered into sheets. Nonmetals typically are not doing any of those things. Uh, Nonmetals are more likely to be a gas or a liquid. Um, if they are solid, then they aren't shiny. We can't hammer them into sheets and so forth. And then we have these things, metalloids. Metalloids tend to touch along this little line and the boxes that I'm coloring in are generally agreed to be where metalloids are, although there can be some disagreement from some people. Metalloids are the elements. It's kind of like the transition between the metals to the nonmetals. These are a handful of elements that share some characteristics over here, such as they might be shiny, but they might not conduct electricity. So they have some characteristics of each. Um, Mainly the only element that kind of touches this line that doesn't quite fit in, again, is aluminum. So Again, a few elements that don't quite fit patterns um, completely, hydrogen, helium, aluminum. Just kind of keep those in mind as you're going through. Um, aluminum is a metal. We make cans out of them, um, do all kinds of things with aluminum, but it is a metal. And again, so there are things on this side of the periodic table that are metals. Again, aluminum has three valence electrons, so it's not very much different uh, than magnesium, which would be over here on this side. Once we have all that straightened out, um, we've got 11 through 14. 11 through 14 are different groups. Uh, the alkali metals are group one, which is this one. So it's group one. The earth metals are group two. All right. So again, these are both metals. They're extremely reactive. Alkali earth metals, they have one valence electron. Alkali earth metals have two valence electrons. Um, we don't tend to see these in nature just hanging out by themselves because they are very reactive and they tend to form compounds. On the other side of the periodic table, we have a couple of other groups that we tend to mention, halogens and noble gases. So our halogens are in group 17. <clears throat> They've got seven valence electrons, also extremely reactive. The noble gases are in the last group, this is group 18, not reactive at all. So that's one of the key things about this group. Um, some of the last elements to actually have been kind of discovered because otherwise they never reacted with anything. Uh, their outside shell is full. Um, 
And so we don't find them working with compounds. When we did formulas and everything, we just kind of never use these because they don't in involve themselves with very much else. There's some patterns that we see on the periodic table based upon uh, how these things are built and put together. Electronegativity, I like to think of this as how much do I want an electron, right? And so the greater the electronegativity, the more of an electron bully it is. And uh, the king of electronegativ electronegativity tends to be fluorine. Right? So there's a pattern that as we move this way on the periodic table, things get to be more electronegative. And as we move up, they get to be more electronegative. And if we combine both of those, we can make an, a resulting arrow that basically says, as we move towards fluorine, things get to be more electronegative. Right? The exception here is we don't count the last column. Again, our noble gases are full of electrons, so they have no need for any more electrons, and so they are not electronegative pretty much at all. Um, again, fluorine is only missing one electron, so it really wants that last one. It's also really small, so the distance between the positive protons and the negative electrons is tiny, so the, the distance is short, which is important when we're talking about forces. So that's our trend for electronegativity. Um, the atomic radius is kind of measuring the distance across the atom. Um, in particular, radius is half the distance of a circle. What we see with an atomic radius is things are getting bigger as we go down. Hopefully that makes sense because it has to do with the number of shells or orbitals. And as we go down, they're getting more and more protons, more and more electrons, more and more neutrons. So things are getting bigger, taking up more space. Oddly enough, though, ten, things tend to actually, when we go this way, even though the numbers on the periodic table get bigger, the size is that they get smaller. And the reason why is because they tend to become more dense. Um, as we move across, every time we go from box to box, we add a proton. Every time we go from box to box, we add an electron. Because the proton and electron have an attraction to one another, they start actually shrinking because these, the, the new electron. Uh, excuse me, the new electron is in the same shell as the previous electron. We're getting pulled closer and closer together. So as we move from the left side of the periodic table all the way to the right, these are getting heavier, no doubt, but they're actually shrinking and taking up less space, which going back to our first three questions means that they're going to end up being more dense. So when you have questions about an atomic radius trend, again, we're getting bigger as we go down. And we're gonna, as we, if we stay in the same row or the same period, they would technically be getting smaller as we move from left to right. Ionization energy is related to electronegativity. It's basically a measure of how hard is it to steal one of my electrons. So I'll just write that. How difficult to steal my electron? So this is real similar to electronegativity because if you want electrons, then you don't want to give them away. But this one actually does involve the noble gases because noble gases are going to be the hardest to steal electrons from. So we get the same pattern. Things get to be have things have higher ionization energies as we move in the same direction as we did for number 15. Although we would include the noble gases in this case. So the more electrons you have, typically it's harder to take them away. And again, the smaller they are, the harder it is to take them away as well. So if you're given uh, a number of elements to compare and say which one has the highest or lowest of any of these on 15, 16, 17. We need to think of our patterns and figure out how that applies. So if we look at a couple of questions on here, what element touches the metalloid staircase but is not a metalloid and is in group 13? Um, that would be aluminum. Okay, so aluminum is in group 13, touches the staircase but is a metal. If we said what's the most electronegative element on the periodic table, our arrow pointed to fluorine. If we said what element has the highest atomic radius, that would be the one at the very bottom of the last row, which would be francium. So just some basic questions to ask if you can interpret your periodic table correctly. And then I'll do this last one with number 21. Again, what has the highest ionization energy? Which one's going to be the most difficult to take an electron from? That should be our smallest noble gas, which is helium. Very difficult to take an electron from it.